glory. Somebody touched me. Good yeah, worship. hallelujah. Good worship. Man, that is so true and so good and so right and wonderful and such a good word. I, I, I'm not sure. I know I don't think I've ever really uh, said anything about, about this song in particular, but of course uh, we've done it many, many times and it's always a blessing. And, and I know when you hear words like the reckless love of God, that you don't really think of God as being reckless, but it's an expression to try to express how deeply God loves us and to what extent God would go to to, uh, to save us and to change us. And it comes, the basic premise comes from Luke 15. And in Luke 15, there's a, there are three stories, three, three analogies to show us how much God loves us and what God is willing, the extent God is willing to go to to save our soul. One is the story about a widow that has 10 coins and she loses one of the coins and she sweeps her house and does all of this stuff until she can find the missing, missing coin and then she calls her neighbors in and they all rejoice because that which was lost is now found. And then we come to a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one of them and he leaves the 99 to go and find the one that is lost. Well, it's reckless to leave 99 because while you leave them, the wolves might come or they might wander off or something might happen to the 99 and it's really not, doesn't make a lot of sense to leave 99 to go find one little lamb but the point is that Jesus loves us so much and you and I are so precious to the Lord that he would leave the 99 safe in the fold to go find the one little lamb that is lost because that's how precious you are. That's reckless, but that's how much he loves you and gives to you. And then the last story is the lost son where he leaves home and and takes all of his inheritance and wastes everything and riotous living, and he comes back because he comes to himself, and he says, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. And Dad says, that's foolishness. Come on, bring the fat, bring the ring and put it on his finger. Bring shoes on his feet. Uh, we're going to identify him. We're going to put him back on. Put, put, put the robe on his back, you know, and let's rejoice. Let's have a party because my son that I thought was gone forever has come back home, and let's rejoice over his uh, being found again. The whole purpose of that, of, that, of that whole chapter basically is to tell us, to sh teach us and to show us what to rejoice over, what to be happy about. And you know what he says to be happy about? Be happy about folks that find the Lord, that we rejoice over that which was lost and is now found in life. If you want to be happy about the right thing, be happy about when the lost is found in the Lord. And that's reckless love of God. So anyway, maybe that's a little interest to you, but it has nothing to do with the message today. But I thought you might want to kind of know a little bit about that. I don't know about you, but when I see words like that and we sing songs like that, if I have something in my heart that kind of backs up what, he's re what it's really dealing with, it just, it just strengthens that concept inside of me and gives me a reason to praise the Lord and to know what I'm praising for and what that's really all about. So anyway, that's how precious you are to God. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah, little lamb, <laughs> little wayward lamb, he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah, little mountaintop hopper, he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one he's going after. But anyway, we're going to talk about happiness today. Um, I know everybody wants to be happy. Is there anybody in the building that really doesn't care about being happy? I mean, you say, well, pfft. I mean, I know how life is, and I don't really have to be happy in life. Uh, no, uh, uh, the universal concept of man and the universal uh, search in mankind is to be happy. Well, why do you do what you do? Well, it, you want to be happy, right? Why do people take drugs? Why do people pursue what they pursue? Why do people do crazy things, dangerous things, illegal things? Why, why do we, why do we, why do we uh, make fools of ourselves? Why, why do we go outside the boundaries of life and do dangerous things? Well, it, 
we want to be happy. <laughs> we pursue what we feel will make us happy in life. Well, can you really be happy in a world like we live in today? Could anybody really be happy in this kind of a crazy environment that we live in today? Uh, well, that question was asked about 30 years ago by Psychology Today magazine, and they, quit, they, they surveyed 52,000 Americans, and they asked them that question, uh, what would it take to make you happy? And these are the 16 answers given in order of how they were answered on this survey 30 years ago as to what it would take to make you happy. Now look, number one is if I had more friends or better friends or some friends, if I had a better job, if I could be in love, that would make me happy. If I could just receive the recognition that I deserve, somebody would notice me, then I could be happy. Or sex, obviously that would be there. And personal growth, you know, that I could, that I feel like I'm progressing in life, that I'm learning more, getting better, or being better, or growing in life. Uh, more money, more money, more money. <laughs> That's a big one. This is, these are things that Americans said would make me happy if I had these things in life. If I had a, a house or a different apartment, better and up and move up. Uh, if I look good, that's going to make me feel better about myself and I'm going to be happy. If I lived in an exciting city instead of this dud place I live in, to be in good health rather than to you know, be sick all the time, uh, to have the right religion. And that just means you know, that I would have some belief system that would uh, encourage me to be happy, then I could be happy. Recreation, uh, being a parent, marriage, and then the last was my partner's happiness. But the thing I want you to notice about all 16 of these things, barring a couple or three of those 16 things, every one of those things are about external things. Uh, not, not something on the inside, but something in my environment around me. If I could just get these things to change around me, then I could be happy. So, so we can conclude from that then that the popular idea of happiness would be having the right circumstances. If I could just have the right circumstances in life, then I could be happy. Now, I call this kind of thinking when and then thinking. When, when this happens, then I can be happy. You know, when, 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 I, when I get out of school, uh, then I can be happy. When I get a job, then I could be happy. When I get married, when, that, then, then, then I could be happy. Uh, when I have children, <laughs> Uh, then I'll be happy until you have them. And then <laughs> when, when, when the children leave and go to college, bless God, then I can be happy. I mean, when the children just leave, praise the Lord, then I can be happy in life. Well, if that's your thinking, that when and then you're living on what I call someday aisle. You ever been to someday aisle? You know, someday I'll be happy, right? <laughs> when, 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 when my credit bills are paid, when my mortgage is paid, when, 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 my, when my wages increase, uh, someday I'll be happy. Someday. Well, does someday really ever come in someday aisle? <laughs> well, really, no. It doesn't really come in life. So what does the Lord have to say about happiness in life? Does he help us out in any way? Does he give us any ideas about how to, how to receive this happiness that we're pursuing in life constantly? Well, in the Old Testament, he gave us a, a whole book about the pursuit of happiness. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, the word Ecclesiastes means the preacher or the teacher. And it was written by Solomon, King Solomon. And you know King Solomon he was David, King David, the greatest king of Israel. King David's son was Solomon. And when King David passed off of the scene, Solomon became the ruler of the empire of Israel. And Solomon, who was the original party animal of life, I mean, he was, uh, Solomon had it all. Solomon was, was, was wealthy beyond imagination, had all the wealth of the entire kingdom of Israel, 
He was, he was attractive. He was a beautiful man. Solomon had 700 wives. 700 wives, God. Now, before you get too excited about that, remember, he also had 700 mother-in-laws. So just keep that in I mean, you do have consequences, right? But he had 700 wives, and he had 300 concubines on top of 700 wives. Imagine, imagine that. He was highly successful in everything in life. And Solomon then, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, basically said to himself, uh, I, I, I decided to enjoy myself and, and find out what real happiness is. And so in the book of Ecclesiastes, there are 12 chapters where Solomon begins to try everything that his mind can think and his heart can think in order to be happy in life, and he records it for us. And look, uh, uh, in chapter 2, there's just a kind of a general synopsis of what he said, and let me just read a few of these verses. This is just kind of a summary. These verses are all in chapter 2, but, but this gives you an idea of what he tried to do. Look, look, look at this. I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with mirth, uh, you know, happiness and, and joy. And I, I'll test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, but surely this also was vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does this, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. Is that even possible? <laughs> you know, really? Can I, can I keep my wisdom when I'm drunk on wine? <laughs> but anyway, and, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. Uh, I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards, and I made myself gardens and orchards. Not myself, you know, my wonderful self. I looked at myself. I enjoyed myself. I wrote about myself. I thought about myself. I, I looked at my wonderful self, Every all of these things. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools to which water uh, uh, with which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem. Before me, I also gathered myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and I excel more than all who were before me in Israel. Also, my wisdom remained with me, which is questionable, but it's what he said. But whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind, and there was nothing gained under heaven. Yeah, yeah. Solomon said, after all of the things that I, that I tried to do, out of all of the things that, that, I, that, that I excelled in, uh, uh, the conclusion of all of these things was, uh, pff, I'm chasing the wind. And when I try to grab it, it it's like grabbing the wind. <laughs> it's, it's vanity, it's vain to try to search all of these things thinking that they're going to make you happy. I tried laughter. I tried amusement. I tried to entertain myself. I, I, I tried wine and liquor and, 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 and all of those, you know, fruits of, of that intoxicating type of life. I tried luxury. I, I had it all. I, I, could, I could build anything. I could, I could, you know, put the greatest assets in these wonderful things that I built. I tried sexual kind of things, man. 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, how long would that take to even be involved with one, you know, uh, uh, every day or whatever it might have been? He said, I tried it all, and I tried to learn. I tried wisdom. I tried knowledge. I, I tried to get the sages of the ages and, and, and get all the wisdom I could acquire. And you know what I found? I found that all of that was just a dead end in life. 
So if you're looking for happiness in any of those things, he says, stop wasting time. You're chasing an illusion. You're chasing the wind. You can't grasp the wind and you can't grasp happiness if you're doing it basically in three, these three categories. If you're trying to find happiness from a, accumulating things or experiencing pleasure or achieving success in life, then you are chasing the wind. Quit doing that. You're wasting your time. And isn't it amazing how those three things are the very things that we spend most of our life trying to find. Yeah, yeah. Just amazing how God told us so long ago, <laughs> you're wasting your time, guys. Listen to me, I'll save you a lot of misery in life. I told you that list that we saw up there was from 30 years ago. Did I mention that? I might not have even said that. But I'm saying now, that list that we saw that was 52,000 Americans and what they said would make them happy, that list was from 30 years ago. So today, I thought, let me see what Psychology Today magazine says about today, about what would make us happy. And, and, and I'm going to read, just look, I mean, this, this thing was like four or five pages long, and it had all kind of documentation of blah, blah, and all this research and so forth. But, but I chose about five or six little short paragraphs, and I'm just going to read you what they say today, 30 years after that. Now, this was from 2016, September of 2016, actually, so it's, it's, fa it's fairly new. And the title of the article was, What Does It Take to Be Happy?, and I'm reading, it says, Now researchers in the field of positive psychology, the so-called science of happiness. I didn't even know there was a science of happiness, but evidently there is. They think they found the keys to happiness. When people are asked about what makes them happy in life, we find that there are three keys. Let me give you these keys. The first is sufficient material resources. That's just a fancy way of saying the accumulation of things. If I could just get things, accumulation of things, the sufficient material resources, this means no worries about meeting our basic biological needs, food, clothing, shelter, health, and so on. It also include, includes the means to do things in life that are enjoyable. In modern Western society, this translates into... More money, more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. The second key is sufficient social resources. Everybody say experiencing pleasure. Experiencing pleasure is sufficient social resources. We, we all need to have meaningful relationships with family members and friends. Our social needs vary according to our personality. Extroverts need more social interaction than introverts, but none of us can be happy unless our baseline social needs are met. So 30 years later, here we are still trying to accumulate things and experience pleasure in life. The third key is living in a stable environment. Everybody say achieving success. Yeah, uh, living in a stable environment, all of us have, have a need to make sense of the world and to understand our place in it. Yeah, to have a place in it, to, to have a meaningful place in it, <laughs> to be successful in this world that we live in. We, 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 we feel that we have a purpose and we want to accomplish that purpose and we want to believe that we have a, a calling in life and that all of us are here for a reason. So we keep striving for success in life is what it says. Faith fills that role for many. Religion provides us with a belief system that brings order to our, our chaotic world and it helps us to understand that we're part of something larger than ourselves. So, 30 years later, we still think if we could accumulate things that somehow we could be happy in life. <laughs> if I could just win the lottery, bless the Lord. Well, don't worry, before long, the state of Mississippi is going to let you spend some money trying to win the lottery. And 
I know a lot of you play it and do it and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but you do understand that you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning. The odds are, are, are better for you to get struck by lightning than it is to win the lottery. You, do, you are aware of this, right? But it, let me just tell you this. But if you do hit it, uh, don't forget your tie. That's all. <laughs> we, we pray for you, man. If you hit it, uh, that tithe, remember the Lord. That's <laughs> right. Somebody asked me, Pastor, would you take that, that old sinful money? You bet I would. There ain't nothing sinful about that. <laughs> the devil's had it long enough. It's time for God to get a few. You know, before Howard Hughes died, and, and many of you young people, don't, and you, you don't really know the name Howard Hughes, but Howard Hughes was a multi-billionaire in, in our generation. I mean, he had more money than, than the federal government, I believe. I don't know. He was just a billionaire. When he died, right before he died, somebody asked Howard Hughes how much money was enough money. And you know what he said? Now, now he's a billionaire. And, uh, all right, you're a billionaire. How much money is enough money? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. Isn't that an idea? If I could just accumulate a little bit more, I would be happy. Oh, this, might, this might surprise you. Do you know when surveyed and people are asked the question, how much more money would you need to make that, that you could be stable and enjoy life? You know what people say from the bottom of the scale to the top of the scale? You know what their answer is? About 10% more. Now, what, now, isn't that amazing? You would think the people at the bottom would say about 100% more. That's what it would take. And the people at the top would say, you know, about 10% because they, they have a lot. But, but, it, but it, no, it, it doesn't pan out that way. From the top to the bottom, people think, well, if I could just have about 10% more, that, that would lighten me up and I could, you know, enjoy a little bit of life and go out to eat and pay my bills. And blah, blah, blah. Well, I grew up because I'm a baby boomer. If you were born between, between 1946 and 1964, you're a baby boomer. About one-third of the population of this country are baby boomers, by the way, in case you wondered how many of us there are. Now, we're the biggest generation that ever hit this, this country. That's why every time we go through a phase of life, it changes the nation. Now, when we were teenagers, there was no rock and roll until the baby boomers rocked and rolled in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys couldn't go into, into birthing chambers. There was no such thing as natural childbirth. Daddies had to stay out. And as a matter of fact, they couldn't even go into the room where the baby was after it was born. The mama stayed in the hospital about a week, and dad didn't even get to see the child until they actually got out of, hos out of the hospital. But when we baby boomers came along, we demanded to be able to go in there and watch him come out to shoot. You know, I mean, come on, man. And there were so many of us, how could they deny this? And then, and then of course, we, you know, we, we baby boomers begin to get fat and, and need to work out. So uh, uh, workout centers were developed. There was no workout places and gyms until the baby boomers started getting a little fat and said, man, give us some stuff and we'll pay for it. And because one third of the population of this country were all that age, that was millions and billions of dollars to be made. So boom, up sprang Workout centers and baby boom bulge, you know, was worked off. Well, now we're getting old, and guess what's the rage of everything? Retirement homes, retirement villages, uh, nursing homes, uh, hospice care, and blah, blah, blah. Pharmacies are springing up everywhere because we baby boomers love our drugs, baby, out of you. Man, we don't want to be, we don't want to feel bad. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to do any of that. And because there's so many of us, the world looks at us and goes, hey, we'll give you whatever you want because there's so many, man, we're going to get rich off of you guys. So we're baby boomers, and, and, and we baby boomers, we grew up in a generation that changed the world, and one of the things we grew up with is television. Television became a part of our lives. You know, there used to be people that they didn't have television, they just had radio. I mean, right at the beginning of my life, kind of, you know, we didn't really have, I mean, TV wasn't a real big deal. It was radios. It just always amazed me that people would sit around and seriously, we would do this. We would, there would be one radio somewhere in the community and people in the community on Saturday night would come listen to the radio and they listen to the Grand Ole Opry out of Nashville, you know, and, and uh, down here in the South, that's what we would listen to. And we'd sit around the radio and we would look at the radio. 
We would look at it like it, and I guess we were waiting for TV or something. We thought maybe, maybe we, it might turn into TV while we were sitting there. And look, we were looking at it like there was a picture on there, and, and we were wanting it to be a picture. But, but anyway, the point is, finally TV came along, and when TV came along, a certain amount of commercialism came along with it. Well, then we had babies, and, the, and, 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 and our babies became uh, the millennials, and so Justin and Amy, and you know those that were born, I think between like 1975 and 1995, were, were called labeled the millennials. Well, the millennials not only had TV, but they had uh, computers started. You know, around the what the late 80s, early 90s, the basic computers and blah blah, and then the internet came along a little bit later to to a big extent. But the point being that once that happened, then they began to have a, a little more commercialism. They had TV and uh, t computer technology. And then their children came along, and now that generation is raised or reared with social media. And social media, you know, Facebook and, and, uh, and, and emails and text messages and uh, what all, the, everything, that, the Instagram and Snapchat and all of that kind of stuff. And websites are filled with commercialism and, and advertisements and pop-ups and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I, and I'm just trying to say that as time has gone on and technology has increased, uh, uh, I, the, the attraction to things has become more and more prevalent in life. And, 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 there's, and there has developed a whole industry that has but one purpose in life. And that one purpose in life is to make you feel like that you are not happy. Every commercial is intended to say, you're not really happy, but if you'll get this product, then you can be happy. It's Ronco, it slices, it dices, it, you know, you can't have a good life without this. It's, you know, I mean, here it is, the great thing of life, and, but wait, it'll, you'll get two for, you know, and, and, and all, of that, all of that is, is an attempt or an effort to say to you that you're not going to be happy unless you buy something new and have some new product in life. And now, if you survey Americans, and this was, this was amazing to me, you would think America would be the happiest country in the world, right? You would think that no one could be happier than an American because we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I mean, we're in the greatest country in the world. We're in a country that will allow you to be anything you want to be in life, that gives you freedom to become something and lets you build your own business or build your own life or nobody tells you what to do or how to do it or you can't do it. And, and, and you would think that that would create an environment where if you ask people all over the world, are you happy that Americans would say, yes, I'm happy, bless God, I'm living in the greatest country in the world. But do you know that... The country of uh, Norway and the Netherlands and Sweden and all of those goofy little countries over there, they're the happiest in the world, according to their testimony. America's like about fourth or fifth or sixth. Only one-third of Americans, one out of three, say, I'm happy. Only one out of three Americans have enough uh, happiness in their life to check a little box that says, I'm happy. I would, and that just, I would think three out of three would say I'm or, or two out of three, or I mean, even give it, you know, 50%. But no, 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 only one out of three. So the accumulation of things. No generation of people on earth have had so many brilliant people with such sophisticated strategies to tell us how unhappy we are than our generations now that are living on this earth. So the accumulation of things has become a big bust, right? Things obviously can't make us happy. So what about experiencing pleasure? Always seeking for the latest thrill. Maybe we need a cruise. That would do it. Or a vacation to Hawaii. I mean, the Bahamas are pretty much out now and Puerto Rico's not so attractive anymore. Let's just say we're going to Hawaii. That would make us happy in life. We love to uh, chill is the word, I guess. What are you going to do? We're gonna, we need to chill. You know, I, you guys know I drive a school bus, right? 
every day, morning and afternoon. One of the buses, one of the loads that I drive are K-5s, kindergarten five-year-olds through sixth grade. The little K-5s sit up by me you know, on the front of the bus. We try to keep them from getting back there with the trouble. Uh, although they are pretty much trouble too. But, but anyway, it's so funny because I heard one of them right in my ear because they sit right behind me and they just yell, use your, use your inside voice, would you? Yelling, I heard them say, uh, I, I said to him, what are you going to do this weekend? I said, boy, I'm glad it's Friday. Me too, Mr. Keith. Uh, uh, well, what are you going to do this weekend? And the little five-year-old said, well, I'm just going to chill. <laughs> I said, chill from what? <laughs> Deciding what color the pumpkin needs to be? <laughs> or rolling up your mat after you take a nap? I mean, is that what you need to chill from? <laughs> Uh, experiencing pleasure. We're a pleasure-mad society looking for the next kick that will allow us to rebel against uh, everything in life without suffering any consequences. My Lord. You know, in my generation, we thought we could have all the sex we wanted. Once birth control pills were discovered, boy, that just opened the door. And man, that meant, whoo, that door is open. And we don't have to worry about the consequences of just having, you know, uh, free sexual activity in life. We thought that in my generation. And drugs, heroin, LSD, whew, man, you're talking about wide open. We thought, boy... You know, you can take all these drugs and there's no consequences to this. This is wow, this is open. And we had just people everywhere just tripping out and everything else. And till we found, till we found that you can't some with some of that stuff you can't ever quit tripping out, out uh, somewhere. I think a lot of them, that's what's wrong with them nowadays. You watch them, they've tripped out way too many times. They're still tripping out. <laughs> And rock and roll, whoo, man, it encouraged us to rebel against everything in society. Our music was about rebelling against everything in society. And we did it too, didn't we? Well, all that was was an effort to experience pleasure without having to experience any of the consequences of that pleasure. And America still does that now. Yeah, yeah. We're vaping ourselves to death with THC and a little vape, you know, with this extremely, you know, poisonous drugs, tiny little amounts killing people because, you know, we want to get a better high and a better enjoyment out of life. So accumulating things won't do it and, the, and, and experiencing pleasure won't do it. What, what about achieving success in life? You know, if I can just get people to envy me, if I can just get people to look up to me, if I can get people to respect, that's a word, respect me, then I'll be happy. So we're, now we're so status conscious. I mean, we wear, we wear Gucci watches uh, in order to impress or a Rolex or whatever it might be. And then, and then we wear $200 tennis shoes, bless God. I mean, come on, man. Yeah, we wear Calvin Klein underwear. Uh, you know, I mean, we're 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 extremely status conscious, and we want to be looked at in favorable lights and glorious ways. Americans have sixty percent of the wealth of the world, and we take ninety percent of the tranquilizers. <laughs> I'll tell you something. You know what Solomon said? Solomon said, "I was king of an empire." I mean, how much more successful can you be? than to be the king of an empire. And he said, let me tell you, I did everything I possibly could to achieve success, and I was extremely successful. And my conclusion is, all of that stuff is vanity. It's like chasing the wind. And so the popular idea of happiness as having the right circumstances is not it. That does not produce happiness. You cannot find happiness by trying to find the right circumstances in life. God's way to happiness is not having the, uh, the, the right uh, circumstances around you. It's about having the right attitude on the inside of you. 
And so with that in mind, in the New Testament, the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 tells us how to be happy. It's Jesus. Jesus is preaching a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, considered to be the greatest sermon he ever preached, by the way, considered to be the constitution of the kingdom of God. If you want to know what the kingdom of God is about, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and Jesus says, here's what the kingdom of God is all about. And he gives us the constitution, just like our country has a constitution that tells us our rights and the rights of the government, blah, blah, blah. Jesus says, here's the rights of the kingdom of God, and here are your rights as a kingdom, as a citizen of the kingdom. Well, the first 12 verses of the Sermon on the Mount are called the Beatitudes. If you want to to really kind of get a definition of what a Beatitude is, just say, it's an attitude I'm supposed to be. (laughs) It's really just as simple as that. It's, It's eight positive statements about happiness, about how to be happy. It's interesting to me that out of all the subjects Jesus could have talked about at the start of this great sermon, I mean, imagine all the subjects you could have started talking about when you want to talk to people about what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is really all about. Why did he start talking to us about happiness? Out of all the subjects Jesus started talking to us about how to be happy in life. Why did he choose happiness? Why did he choose eight ways to be happy in life? Because Jesus knew that every single one of us was searching for happiness and that very few of us would ever find happiness if he didn't tell us how to find it. Because we look in, uh, as the old country song, you know, says, looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah, we look in all the wrong places. So, so I'm going to read a few of these. I'm going to read them all, really, right here quickly for us. And, and I want you to notice something. Every one of these Beatitudes begin with the same word. It's the word blessed. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And it is the Greek word, and I don't want to try to get too um, technical here, but the Greek word is makarios. Mm -hmm. And the Greek word makarios can be translated, and it is translated in the Bible, blessed or happy. In other words, the word that the King James Version uses is blessed are these, blessed, but it could just as easily be uh, translated happy are you, and this, and this, and this, and this. And so, and so here, here, here's what he says. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Happy are you. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers. Notice it doesn't say the peace lovers. Everybody loves peace, right? If if they ask you, you would say, yes, I want peace. It doesn't say happy are the peace lovers or the peace wanters. It says happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Do these, do these sound like contradictions to you? I mean, happy, be happy when you're sad. Be happy when you're poor. Be happy when you're put down or, or persecuted. <laughs> you know, when people lie about you and say all kinds of evil, I- I'm supposed to be happy? That doesn't sound like happiness to me. I believe what Jesus was saying here is, look, the world says in order to be happy, you have to have the right circumstances in life. But what I'm saying to you is you can learn to be happy. You do not have to have the right circumstances 
in life in order to be happy. You can be happy in spite of your circumstances in life. Because let me ask you this. Are you ever going to have everything in your life solved, every problem solved, everything perfect in your life? Is that ever going to be true about, uh, about your life? Never, right? right? Every time you nail something down before you get something else nailed down, that end kicks up, you know, everything that was nailed down is now coming up. Uh, if, you, if you have to have everything perfect in your life in order to be happy, you're not ever going to be happy, right? right. There's always something to be concerned about. So what's the point? The point is my happiness is not determined by what's happened around me. My happiness is determined about, uh, by what's going on inside of me. It's not, it's not my circumstances. It's my attitude. And you make the choice. That's why this series is called It's Your Choice. You, you, you make the choice in life of whether you're happy or not because the truth is, the truth is whatever state of happiness you're in right now, if you're real happy right now or you're real sad right now or you're somewhere in between, you are just about as happy as you choose to be. Life is tough, right? That's an understatement of the year. Life is tough, and lots of things don't go right in life. A lot of bad circumstances in life. Huh? You were on top last week, now you're on the bottom. Circumstances have flipped on you, and there are lots of bad circumstances in life. So in order to be happy, if you're going to be happy in life, it's not going to be about what happens to you. It's going to be about how you respond to what happens in you. And that is an inside job, and it comes from the inside out. And Jesus said, you can choose to be happy. And the first step to happiness, and don't let this blow your mind when I put it up here, all right? But this is what Jesus says is the first step to being happy in life. And it is to choose the right attitude. And the right attitude, according to Jesus, is to be poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does it mean that I have low self-esteem? Does it mean I walk around putting myself down? I'm poor in spirit. I'm worthless. I'm lousy. I'm junk. I, I'm not worthy of the effort. Uh, uh. No. Poor in spirit doesn't mean low self-esteem because Jesus didn't die for junk and Jesus died for you. Mm -hmm. And so because Jesus gave himself for, me, for you, that makes you valuable. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm valuable. Okay. Also look at him and say, not perfect, but valuable. <laughs> okay, I'm not perfect, but I'm valuable. Being poor in spirit literally means I realize my dependence on God. Now, let me tell you how, how you come to the conclusion that poor in spirit means I, I have a dependence on God, and when I recognize that, that makes me poor in spirit. Where this phrase poor in spirit comes from, it comes out of a context where people were encouraged uh, to do what God calls us to do. And when we do what God calls us to do, God might call us to do the very low things in life, the, 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 the uh, look down on the servant things, the, the things that aren't really valued or the people that are the last and the least and the lost and the lonely. And, and we're called to minister to the low in life or we're, or, or we're called to minister to the poor in life, those things that would not be concert, considered exciting and, and, uh, and, 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 and career boosting, and all that, but that God has a call and that we as the children of God would submit ourselves from God and no matter how low or how poor our assignment, we would be willing to do it because we are submitted to God. We're the poor in spirit. I'm humble in life. When I'm humble in life, what does it mean? It means I'm teachable. You, I don't know everything. I'm not the master of the universe. I'm not the all in all. I, you can teach me stuff if I have a humble attitude. I'm submissive to God. I'm patient. I'm cheerful. 
Uh, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why am I happy if I'm humble and submitted to God? Why am I cheerful when I'm given a poor assignment in life? It's because I know that the kingdom of heaven is mine. Yeah. And that makes me happy because he's not just talking about the kingdom of heaven that comes one day when we die and go to heaven. The kingdom of heaven right now is a kingdom that lives inside of us, guys. Right now, the kingdom of heaven is right here. One of these days, Jesus is going to come back and take us to glory, and we're all going to be up there together, and a lot of great things are going to be happening with us, the marriage supper of the Lamb and the great re re giving of rewards and crowns and all, and we live with the Lord forever. But right now, the kingdom of heaven is in our hearts. We are given peace. We're given joy. We're given power by the Holy Spirit of God invading our life and creating joy and happiness and strength and security and power of God in our life. Therefore, we can be happy when we recognize our need for God because it gives us joy. It gives us power. It gives us strength. It gives us the Holy Ghost of God working in our life. So Jesus said, choose the right things and choose the attitude of being humble in life. Humility, maybe the easiest way to think about what it means is to think about the opposite of what it means. The opposite of humility would be what? Arrogance. Or prideful. So Jesus is saying, if you're full of arrogance, if you're, if you're full of egotism, and you're never, you're never going to be happy. And the, and the more you learn and depend on, on, on God, the more peace you're going to have. So Jesus says happiness and humility go together. And if you want to be, learn to be happy, then you got to learn to be humble. Let me just give you this real quick. How can humility increase my happiness in life? Number one, wait a minute. Number one, humility reduces stress. You say, how, how can I be happy if I'm humble in life? Well, if I choose to be humble, it's going to lower the stress in my life. And the lower the stress goes in my life, the greater the happiness comes into my life. What do you mean? What do you mean it reduces stress? Well, let me just we'll show you a couple of things. Did we put a slide up there? Yeah, here we go. These two things, at least these two things happen. Number one, I don't, if I'm humble, I don't have to have all the answers. I realize that the world's existence doesn't depend on me. I can resign as general manager of the universe. I've told you that I finally resigned as general manager of the universe, right? I know that all shakes you up, you know, that shakes all of you up, but, but there was a time where I thought it was my job to fix everybody. Yeah. I mean, preachers fix people, right? You come talk to the preacher, the preacher fixes you. Do you realize how much pressure that is? You remember how much stress goes with that? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I can't fix anybody. Mm -hmm. right. Only God can fix people. Amen. I can't fix people. So when I realize that, that gives me freedom in life that I don't have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to fake it. I don't have to try to be perfect. I don't have to perform in perfect ways and make you think, uh, uh, that I'm way better than I am uh, and I don't have to be perfect in order to be happy because I know God doesn't require me to be perfect in order to be happy. So if I'm humble before God, I don't have to have all the answers and when I'm humble, I can live with the tension between the real and the ideal. Do you have any tension in your life between the real and the ideal? By that I mean uh, what you want life to be, what you maybe even thought life was going to be, like I want my life to be this, I want my family to be this, I want my children to be this, I want my career to be this, between that and the way it really is. <laughs> I want it to be this, but this is the way it really is. <laughs> Humility allows you to accept the fact that Things aren't always ideal. You don't have to have the best job, the perfect marriage, the brilliant children. Well, come on, man. You mean I can, be, I can be happy without the best job or the perfect marriage or the brilliant, most brilliant children? Sure you can. 
if you don't take yourself too seriously. Humility allows you not to take yourself so seriously. You know what I think some of our problem is? We take ourselves far too seriously. And we don't take God seriously enough. And so humility can, can, can take my life to the point where I'm depending on God's grace and God's mercy and it reduces the stress in my life. And as the stress goes down, happiness comes up in life. So what can being poor in spirit do to help my life be happy? It reduces stress. Here's another one. It improves relationships. Let's take a quick test in life really quickly here. Number one, how many of you like to be around people, well, we, it's a word we used to use, with the big head? The big head. I don't know if, if you younger people even know what I'm talking about. Uh, people, people that think more of themselves than they all think. Yeah. How many of you like to be around people like that? I mean, you'd say today, you know, Pastor, after church, I want to go out to eat lunch with a conceited jerk. I, I just... I, I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I want to do that. You know, that, that ego tripper at work, that Mimi bird, that, that person that no matter what me's done, they got to have something better than me. Whatever story you tell, they got a better story. They got a better ending. That Mimi bird. You, you love to be around people like that. No, no, no. Nobody's raised their hand on it. You know, what, my point is that prideful people are a real pain, aren't they? Why are prideful people a pain? Because they literally wreck relationships. Because they're, un, they're, they're never happy in life. Nothing can ever make them happy in life. And because they're not happy, they don't want anybody else around to be happy. And so they drag their doom and gloom everywhere. On the other hand, how many of you people like to be around humble people? Yeah, people that are not stuck on themselves. People that are that are, that, that, that are not try, uh, trying to impress you all the time. People that don't have to have a better story than your story. Humble people just get along better with others. Humility, I think, is one of the most misunderstood attitudes in the world. Humility doesn't mean that I think less of myself. Humility means that I think more of others. And I, I let you in on a little secret. And the more interested you become in others, the more interesting you become to others. Try it. Try letting somebody talk about their lives and just listen and be interested in what they're saying. That's humility. Humility is, hey, man, I want to know about you. Come on, tell me. And it's not, and then when they start talking, you don't have to say, well, I have better experience than that. Yeah, no, just listen and, and be interested in what somebody else is about and watch how interesting you become to them. Oh, yeah. And one of the reasons is because you don't have trouble in relationships because you don't have any trouble saying the hard words. Two hardest words in relationship life? I'm sorry. <laughs> Three hardest words? Please forgive me. Four hardest words? Please forgive me a, a lot. <laughs> yeah. St. Thomas of Assisi, a Catholic monk centuries ago, heard a real interesting story about, about him. He, he wrote in his memoirs that whenever somebody praised him, that he would go get another monk to come and tell him all of his faults. And I thought to myself, why in the world would he do that? Why, when somebody praised him, would he go get another monk to tell him all of his faults? And then it dawned on me. Being a monk, he was never married. And so he had to go get someone else. <laughs> to tell him all of his mess. Many of us don't have to go get another monk, do we, right? Because God's already given us a gift of heavenly sandpaper um, to sit right there in our own home. Now, how many of you automatically thought I was talking about women? I didn't say women. I mean, I'm, this is men or women. But you automatically thought women. Now, oh, wait, wait a minute, men. Don't start looking around. It's not the time. Don't start looking. Just look straight ahead, right? Okay, it's not time for you to start looking around. 
uh, but the fact is, we laugh about it, but the fact is, seriously, seriously, it is not my job to keep my mate humble. That's not my job. That's God's job. I like what Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, said. Here's what she said. She said, my job is to love Billy. It's God's job to keep him humbled. Yeah, it, it, it's my job to love. It's God's job to keep us humble. We're not, we're, not, we're not asked by God to make sure our mate's humble. I've noticed something about myself. When I'm full of pride, I bruise very easily. I'm like a, I'm like a puffed up balloon, you know? And if you prick me a little with a pen, I, you know, because I'm full of myself. And I'm full of pride and I don't want to be criticized and I can't take it. But when I'm walking with the Lord, I'm almost oblivious to criticism. You can say anything about me and it won't bother me a bit because I'm walking with the Lord. And it doesn't matter to me what you say or what you... It could be right. It could be wrong. It could be good. It could be bad. Uh, but I'm just trying to walk with the Lord. And that's an attitude of humility. So it reduces stress. It, it improves relationships. One more little thing here. It releases God's power. Now, I'm going to quickly get this to you. James 4, and here it is, verse 6. He gives more power. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, let me just sum that up to say that what, what chapter 4 in James is about is about a church that's in problems, and it starts with the first verse. Where do these wars and fightings come from among you? Don't they come here from the lust that war in your members? This is a church he's talking to. Uh, you, war, you, fight, you war and you fight and you have not uh, because you ask not. And then he says, you ask and you don't get it because you ask it with the wrong motives so that you can consume it on yourself. Uh, and then he says something real sweet to them. You adulterers and adulteresses. He didn't read the book on how to win friends and influence people, did he? You adulterers and adulterers. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? God resists the proud. You know what resist means? Fights against, wars against. Now, I want to say this, you know, as, as, as lightly as I can. Um, I love what God's doing here in our church. I, I, it's, it's great, it's wonderful to be your pastor, and I think about what God's doing, and, and the, more, the more I think about it, the more thankful I am. I have lots of emotions that I go through when I think about you guys and what God's doing and these later years of my life, been in the ministry for 45 years, been in all kinds of churches and blah, blah, blah. But I think about this church and I, I, I praise the Lord, I thank the Lord, I, 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 I sense that responsibility that God has given me. But sometimes I'm going to just admit to you that I have a little bit of fear in my life when I think about, about what God's doing here because uh, I really do want to stay in, in the place where God can bless me yes, and, yes, yes. and not fight against me. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I don't want to be in a place where God's coming against me. I mean, because the, the devil I can whip with God's power, but uh, I can't fight against God. I can't beat God. And so I don't want the Lord to fight against me. And where is that place that I can be where God would not fight against me? This place of humility. When I'm humble, God gives me more strength and more power. And when I'm proud, God fights against me. Amen. The blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So